This episode of GT the Podcast is supported by Alcon. This is Ike Ahmed. And I'm Arsham Shabani. And we want to welcome you to GT the Podcast. We're bringing this to you together with BMC and Glaucoma Today. To offer audible insights into current topics in glaucoma care. Presented by the authors of our latest, most read GT articles. Check it out. Welcome to another episode of Survey Says with Dr. Paul Singh. On this special edition of GT the Podcast, Dr. Singh presents a real patient case from his practice and asks his guests to share how they would manage it. Today's episode features Drs. Monica Ertel and Mark Gallardo. The case discussed today involves a patient with moderate primary open angle glaucoma and a history of failed trabeculectomy, slowly progressive visual field loss, and fluctuating IOP in the right eye. The patient is on latanoprost and timolol, but their level of medication compliance is unclear. The patient's left eye has advanced primary open angle glaucoma and a history of trabeculectomy, but IOP is stable off drops. The panelists weigh in on why the patient may be progressing, what the target IOP should be, and which treatment to try next. They also discuss the potential value of home tonometry in guiding the next steps, the role of MIGS, and how to prioritize reducing medications. Later, the guests find out how their colleagues would treat the patient based on results of a poll of GT's audience conducted on social media. Tune in to Survey Says with Dr. Paul Singh. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Survey Says. My name is Paul Singh, uh, glaucoma anterior segment surgeon out here in southeastern Wisconsin. And uh, really excited to have two awesome, awesome surgeons and friends and colleagues and educators with us on this cool podcast. And first I'm going to have Monica Ertel introduce herself and say hi to everybody. Hey Paul, thanks so much for having me. I'm Monica Ertel. I'm at the University of Colorado and um, do mostly resident education. Awesome. Well, excited to have you with us tonight. And uh, another good friend of mine, way down, way down south uh, in Texas, way in the southern part of Texas. Tell us about you, Mark. So what are you doing down there in Texas, man? I know, I know well, you know, well down, down, down here in El Paso, Texas, is, it's not the southernmost tip of Texas, though. Uh, that, that would be Brownsville. But, um, you know, we, we run a tertiary referral glaucoma center at El Paso Y Surgeons. Uh, been in practice about 17 years now, uh, fellowship program for about the past seven years. Um, that's about it. Living the I dream. Living the dream, glaucoma dream that we all face every day. <laughs> I love it. But no, I'm so happy to have Monica and you, Mark, uh, with us tonight. And we're going to talk, we're going to talk about some, a cool case. one of my cases, real case, no bull here. Um, and we, we do it for everybody just to remind everybody. So survey says the idea is we have a case that, that you know, a real case of mine. And we just kind of s- submit the case and uh, see what happens in social media, what people would do in terms of what's, let's say, target pressure, what's the next step. And then we discuss it amongst ourselves here on this program, kind of see what we would do and kind of how we interpret the audience uh, responses as well. So it's kind of a fun little survey says kind of episode. So what I'm going to do first, guys, is I'm going to just read out the case so everyone's on the same page. And then we'll go through kind of your thoughts before we get into the audience participation part of it with the audience results. And then uh, kind of have a just open uh, open discussion dialogue about the responses and kind of what you guys think you would do in your practices. So let's let's start off with the case. I'll, I'll read it out loud. This is verbatim from what we submitted. It's a 74-year-old pseudophagic uh, white Caucasian, or so white female uh, with moderate POAG MD of less than, or rather MD of minus 12 with significant superior visual field defect, but sparing the central 10 degrees. Um, history of failed trab, so had a trab many years ago, uh, but had some slowly progressing visual fields. So not a, not su- significantly progressing, but slowly progressing, but the pressures were fluctuating from the middle to upper teens to low 20s uh, in the right eye. Uh, left eye had mild glaucoma, still doing pretty well on, on uh, basically topical drop PG at night. Uh, but no known history of, uh, of SLT or any angle-based MIGs before, just had a TRAB uh, before. And patient actually um, uh, had a gonioscopy, had open angles, grade four open angles, one or two plus t- tigmented TM. 
on topical atanaprost and a beta blocker in the morning, Tim Lull, but she's really not sure about her compliance. We, we don't believe her. She says she just she takes it, but she doesn't really <laughs> like everybody went over her patients. And, and um, she has surface issues. So she had really bad dry eyes, complaints of fluctuating vision, always complaining of the eyes hurting and having a hard time seeing, has d- documented recently demodex blepharitis as well. Um, and so, sorry, left eye, brother, I lied. Left eye has advanced glaucoma, my fault, and history of trabeculectomy, but pressures are doing well. Sorry. So she's stable in the left eye, uh, but had advanced glaucoma, but she had trab and she's a pressure of 10 off and drop. So doing well, left eye, post-trab, right eye, fields are getting slightly worse, fluctuating pressures on the PG at night, symbol in the morning, but a trab that failed. And no history of any angle-based MIGs, but the angle looks open. You can see the TM. So with that said, just in general, guys, I was asking you got a question. So what, what are your thoughts? So it's progressing slowly, but she's, you know, she's not that old. I mean, I mean, to me, to me, she's only, you know, 74, which I don't think is very old at all. Um, and she's pseudophagic, which is great. So she's already had her cataract taken out. What are your thoughts on this patient? Any, I mean, general thoughts. How aggressive would you want to be with this patient? She's a healthy 70-year-old person and kind of target ranges. And where, where, why do you think she's progressing? Is it fluctuating? Is it, do you need absolutely lower pressure? So Mark, why don't you start us out? What are your thoughts on this patient? so far hearing this you know if she has compliance problems her, her pressures are probably all over the place and i would bet that when she was in your office her pressures were as good as they're going to get because she probably used the medications the day or two before her office visit um so you know i, I think she's somebody that we need to get into the low to mid teens um and with all that we have available to us, it's really hard to give a good answer on what is correct for the patient because we have so many different options. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really curious to see what you, what, what you want to say, Monica, in terms of how we're going to treat this patient. But you know, when I'm training my fellows, it, they always ask me, well, how, how do you pick what procedure you're going to do next? And, and I think there's, there's really no good answer. But the only answer is we need to get the pressure under control. That's true. So question. So speaking of that, Monica, so pressure being controlled, what does that mean to you? I mean, that, that's a question people ask all the time is, do you have to get a pressure super low or do you want to just stabilize it? And talk about that, that kind of mentality between the stabilization and absolute reduction. Yeah, I think so this one thing I've really started to incorporate so much more into my practice is eye care home and really getting a good picture of what a patient's pressure is. Because to Mark's point, I have so many patients who are progressing, who have pressures that are at their target. But then when I do eye care home and I look at two weeks of their pressure readings, I'm shocked at how high their pressure spikes. And I really do think it can help you decide which procedure is best for that patient because you can oftentimes be less aggressive if your goal is not to get a pressure of 10 or 12, but maybe to get a pressure of 15 that doesn't spike to 24 overnight. So, you know, I think having an idea of what this patient's pressure really is doing is super helpful, and I think it helps guide your next step. So, you know, based on the information that we have, I would say she probably needs mid-teens, maybe um, low-teens, a pressure of mid to low teens, which really does give you a lot of options for how to approach this case. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question and a really good comment, rather, both of you guys made. And I think that's something I'm realizing, just like you guys mentioned. So much of what I used to think was I have to drive the pressure to 10 in every patient, you know, otherwise it's going to get worse. And I've been surprised. At, and, and this is why it's important to think about angle-based MIGs a lot of times. I'm not saying that's the right answer. But in general, when people talk about angle-based MIGs, they say MIGs, they say, well, you know what, Paul? It doesn't get us down very low. It gets us in the middle teens sometimes. And, you know, is that worth it? Well, I've had a number of patients who I who were progressing at, at a pressure of 15, 16. But then you do a, a something, even an SLT for that matter, you stabilize the IOP enough in the same range. And yet they don't progress. So I think we don't have enough data to know which patients are like that or not always. That, that would be the golden ticket. But I do think, in, in, in my opinion, is it's a combination a lot of times of stability of the IOP, less fluctuation. And then, of course, for some patients, getting it down a little bit lower too as well. And I think that's kind of what the audience said in this kind of um, when we asked the audience about what would you need next, lower IOP you know, lower fluctuation or both. And I think we looked at Instagram, you looked at Twitter, you looked at LinkedIn. I think pretty much majority of, you know, 75 to 90% of the other respondents said combination of both. I think the idea of combination of lower IOP, but also minimizing fluctuation as well. And so I guess you guys a question. So do you think there's a value to even reducing the drop burden 
by even one drop. So someone's on two drops. You get them off the Timolol. You get them off the PGA. You're only on one drop. Is that valuable enough to do something? I mean, there, there's a lot of question about, well, if you can't get them off of all drop, is a MIGS or something else, drug delivery or something else worth it? And I'll get your thoughts on that, just generally speaking. Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Is it worth one drop to reduce? I guess it depends on the patient. But, you know, if somebody argues that you're going to do a filter because you think you're going to get them off of all medications, it's, it's not correct. I mean, I've, I've had patients that have had filters uh, either a year ago or 15 years ago. And patient, you know, those procedures don't always are, they're not always a complete success where you get them down to their target IOP and off all the medications. Um, you know, I don't, I don't care what procedure that you're doing on a patient, you're not always going to have complete success. You know, it's what we use to define complete success in study is that you get them off all drop drops and you reach your, your target pressure or your percent reduction that you want. But I think you ha you'd have to look at the overall safety profile of a certain procedure and what the patient goals are. And for me, it, I've been doing a lot more SLT to get a patient off of one medication or trying to get them off of two or I'll couple an SLT with a sustained drug delivery device to try to get them off of two medications because even one medication can have a significant amount of effect on the ocular surface um, or even on the patient's pocketbook. So I would say, yes, it would be worth trying to do something to get a patient off a of medication. So Monica, I mean, to, to, to Mark's point, so let's say whatever decision you made for this patient, let's say, or any patient, let's say you were able to get the pressure down. So let's say it was from the upper teens and low twenties down to middle teens, like you said, middle teens, low teens, but they're on, but they're still on, on a med. So I mean, or on two meds. So we wanted to reduce their IOP and reduce the fluctuation. You know, let's say we only got them off of one med. Is that worth it? Doing something that maybe less potential risks in terms of adverse events postoperatively, but doing let's say an angle based make, let's say, than doing let's say a subconj. Curious in your thoughts on that. A couple of really good points. So the first good point is this is a patient who's progressing. So our our goal is really to lower the pressure. And so I don't I hate to get greedy and say, I'm gonna lower the pressure and get you all drop off of all your drops, right? Because um, I think if we accomplish just a lower pressure, we're winning in this patient. Um, so that being said, the more drops I can get a patient off of, the happier my patients tend to be for quality of life or ocular surface, especially in this patient who has ocular surface disease. So um, I like to, you know, balance the safety profile of the procedure with what the goals are for the patient. I mean, I have patients who come in who are taking three or four drops and are like perfectly happy. Their surface looks terrible, but they're not bothered by it. Um, and those patients, if I need to lower their pressure, it's less about getting them off a drop and just about lowering pressure. So I do think if I can get a patient off of drops, it's important, but um, the question of whether it's worth the risk in a patient like this. The other thing is, Paul, you said she's young. She's 74. So I may start less aggressive in someone who's as young as she is and, you know, young in, in the world of glaucoma clinic um, mm -hmm. because the next step is important too. So um, thinking about maybe taking a, a less aggressive approach and keeping her on a drop with the idea that we have something else to do in the future is important too. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, these are great points. And if you look at the audience polls from, you know, all the LinkedIn and, and Instagram and Twitter, the majority of the docs said, yeah, they want pressure in the lower teens, maybe mid teens. So, you know, definitely driving the pressure down is important. Uh, so now let's get to the nitty gritty. Let's get really uh, kind of detail about this in a second, but let's get down to like, kind of, okay, what would you do next? And again, I'm not saying any one product is any right or wrong, but just in general, let's go, let's back it up more right now and just say, okay, so if our goal is to get them down, get her down in the lower to mid teens, she's in the upper teens, low twenties, fluctuating on beds. You know, do we want to go angle based mix in general, or do you want to go subconscious? You want to do a laser slash drug delivery? So, give me your thoughts. I, I'm not going to leave the witness. Just uh, give me your thoughts, Mark, first again, and then go to Monica. What are your thoughts on generally? What would you, what are your th what would you like to do in, if, in your clinic? So, you know, for me, for this patient, because they're already suffering from ocular surface disease, I, I would probably take them to the OR for an angle-based procedure. Um, I would want to maximize the outflow. And, and, again, and again, like Monica said, we're always preparing for the next step. And so in, in a situation like this, I, I wouldn't go straight for something like the GAT procedure, even though I think it works wonderfully in so many patients. 
But now that we have iStint Infinite, where we can do it as a standalone procedure, I, I'd probably want to maximize outflow by, by doing canaloplasty through an ab internal approach. And then I, I'd implant the iStint Infinite to help maximize that outflow as, as my first step in therapy for this patient. Because the experience that I've had with coupling the two procedures, I, I not only bring their pressures down, but I reduce their medication burden. So I think this would be perfect for this patient. So yeah, so canaloplasty, viscodilating, flush the system out, and then maintain it with these those three stents, basically, uh, as a long term as well. And then it's, well, the good thing about the stent is now this is actually the quote unquote typical patient for the FDA approval of the ice and infinite was a post you know surgical glaucoma patient who's uncontrolled on max medical thyroid therapy. This is kind of the perfect patient from that perspective, from an approval perspective. So good good points. What are your thoughts, Monica? And then we can talk more about it. Yeah, I think you could take one of two approaches and depending on really the goals of the patient, you could even start with a SLT in this patient. Um, I think likely given the fact that she's had um, a trabeculectomy that's failed and on two drops, the likelihood of success is lower, but she is spiking up into the 20s and maybe even higher. So um, I think you could start with an SLT, but I do think eventually in the near future, she's going to need something in the operating room. And I agree with starting with an angle-based approach. Um, I think a 360 goniotomy is a great option in this patient. Um, I think she, you know, somebody who would do really well with something uh, uh, approaching a little bit more of the angle and doing something a little bit more aggressive in the angle, um, given her, her uh, moderate disease. So that would be my, my approach surgically. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's, let's talk about that real quick before we go into details. You know, the idea that, you know, you could even do SLT at, at early on. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to just think about what are our goals and just think about what we're trying to achieve. And if, if, it, if it's within that reason, then I think it's awesome. So you say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna do SLT knowing probably not gonna get them off the PG and, and, the, and the beta blocker. Because they're in the upper, you know, teens, low twenties. I can't probably get down to low teens off of meds with just an SLT. But if I'm just trying to get them down and then see if they, see how that works before we do anything else, and then talk about what else we could do to get them off of meds, great. But the the, the goal is going to be different than what we're doing with GAD or subconj. But if you say, hey, you know what? Let me do SLT and then maybe do a drug delivery, do like a bimatoprostatin release, or you know, consider even IDOS, let's say. But you can say, okay, you know what? Let me just go ahead and do a Durista even and an SLT, you're going to get a probably good chance of getting them off that topical latanoprost at least with the, with the Durista and, and or IDOS. And then, you know, you can do your, of course, SLT, and that may get you down to the middle teens probably on that combo, depending on, you know, obviously SLT works about 75% of the time in terms of data. So that's a great option. Absolutely. Um, but you're right. You're probably not going to get the longevity that you probably might get with some of the other procedures. But if you're someone who's not comfortable doing MIGS or, does, or doesn't do glaucoma surgery and you don't want to, you don't have the opportunity to, you know, send them someone else, let's say for some reason, that's an SLT and drug delivery is a great combo for a lot of docs. And there's absolutely no reason we can't do it after a TRAB or some other subcon surgery. So I think it's a great opportunity for some out there who aren't doing, you know, surgical procedures. With that said, I think the longevity, like we talked about, I think an angle-based MIGS or a subcon surgery or even a laser, like an ECP or micropulse or slow burn even. Have you guys thought about doing those? Do you guys do anything like that? Like, you know, let's say slow burn type of CPC or a micropulse or even ECP. Anyone want to comment on that? Monica, do you do those at your, your center? This episode of GT the Podcast is supported by Alcon. I do. I do. Um, I've started to incorporate a lot more. I call it low and slow, slow burn CPC. Um, uh, and, and I've had great success. And I think the safety profile is excellent. My patients tend to do fairly well. Um, I use it a lot after tubes, after um, a, a failed tube. I think that's um, kind of where it fits in nicely in my practice. But I think ECP is a great option in this patient, too. Um, she's pseudophagic, so she's a good, a good ECP candidate. Yeah, I think we kind of underutilize ECP, to be honest with you. I think it's one of the earliest MIGS procedures that we had. And I think with the, you know, with some of the new probes that have been out there and I think new, new protocols, inflammation's controlled pretty well. I don't think we get, you know, kind of those, those issues we faced early on when we started doing it. So that's a great opportunity. I mean, what about, what about you, Mark? Are you doing any kind of CPC, slow, slow and slow burn or, uh, ECP? I, I do. I, I tend to use it kind of in between my angle-based procedures and my filters. Uh, for, for in terms of the micropulse, uh, of course, the the big daddy, the you know, the G probe, I say for after everything, <laughs> because you know I, I don't want to do the the big ciliobladed procedure uh, early in in my algorithm. But 
I like using the lighter ones like the Micropulse or ECP. I used to do a lot more Micropulse back when the center that I, that I was operating at had the unit and probes and, and our unit went down about five years ago and they just decided not to invest in a new unit because I was the only one using it. But now that I have my own center, we are going to look at getting a new unit so that we'll be able to incorporate that. And, and I agree. I, th- I think this patient, given that they're pseudophagic for in the eye, why not you know, help with the inflow system while we're helping with the outflow system at the same time? And that's in co- combining things. You know, I mean, you you mentioned too, Mark, combining canal dilating procedures with stenting. You know, we talk about SLT and drug delivery. So maybe, you know, maybe some inflow outflow ECP with some canal based surgery too, helping kind of both sides as well. Of course, reimbursement is always an issue. Of course, we can talk about another another lecture, <laughs> another survey. But I mean, that's definitely something to think about as well. And I'm just as we're talking, I'm just looking at the results uh, from the polling. And <laughs> if you look at this, is where I think was really interesting to see how. You know, the different social media platforms, we found different responses, really. Uh, so if you look at Instagram, when you said, what is the next step? Sustained drug delivery, laser, SLT, micropulse, and or ECP, conventional outflow MIGs, or subcon surgery. And this was including revision of the TRAB, a MIBs, a ZEN, treated tubes, you name it, everything. So it was like everything. But a majority of them said, you know, 38% said um, uh, a subcon surgery, but it was also equal to conventional outflow MIGs. So between outflow MIGs and subcon surgery of some tort type, it was kind of a mix of uh, uh, even the split. But if you look at like LinkedIn, 80%, sorry, sorry, 16% rather said subcon surgery, but majority said SLT, micropulse or ECP. And, and then next was conventional pathway MIGs. So subcon was last. And if you look at Twitter, Twitter was 50% uh, subcon surgery. So it's, it did split a little bit differently between LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, where Twitter wanted mostly 50% wanted subconj versus when he said, you know, LinkedIn only subconj was only at 16%. So this shows you glaucoma is so freaking hard because there's no right answer. It's, it's, it's great because we have a job because we, we there's no right answer, but I want to get down to this a little bit less, like next 10 minutes, just to kind of get an idea of, of what we could do. If all of them are appropriate. And so let's talk about the subconj. I want to get back to the angle based MIGs in, in the last, but subconj. So if you had, let's say, a scarred bleb that was fibrotic, would you consider doing a revision or just do a new Zen slash TRAB or tube? I mean, let me ask you, how do you decide between revising it, a TRAB, or let's say revising a Zen, or placing a new subcon surgery somewhere else? What are you guys' thoughts? Monica, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, a few things go into my decision. So if it's a surgery that I've done, I'm more likely to revise it. I'm much less likely to revise a surgery that someone else has done. Um just because I don't know what I'm, I don't always know what I'm getting myself into and, um, and the potential post-operative course that the patient had. So, um, more likely to revise it. I do love TRAB revisions. Um, if it's been scarred down for some time, for a couple of years, um, I would probably think about doing something new and different. So either a Zen, which I'd probably lean a little bit less towards in this patient, something more like a tube, especially, um, given the fact that she's had a failed trabeculectomy, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of my decision. I, I think it depends on the post-operative course. If I did the patient, if I did the tube, I'm sorry, the trab. Um, and if I didn't do the trab, I'm less likely to revise it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You don't know what, what the trab flap looks like <laughs> underneath when you open it up sometimes as well. Um, how about con- Mark, how about the con? So Monica mentioned kind of, you know, if it's fibrotic or some of that, do you, I mean, is that, is that, is the con the most important thing if it's like thick and, or kind of tight versus if it's loose or does it look like cystic? I mean, is that, does the, de- does the morphology of the bleb play into whether you revise it or is it just if you did it or not kind of thing? It, it It's kind of both. I, I agree with Monica. If, if I did, the initial procedure, then I'd be more apt to actually revise it. If somebody else did it, I, I tend to not revise someone else's work because I, I don't know what their post-operative care was like. I don't, I don't know how the patient responded. I don't know how quickly they they scarred down. But blood morphology is huge. And so if, if I have somebody that that has a significant amount of subconjunctival, subconjunctival fibrosis, I I just, I, at least in my hands, I don't get a great result from re- revising that one procedure in that area. So I'll go with a filter in a different part of the eye. And it's one of the reasons why, why I've, I've always kind of planned out my surgeries where back when I would do the ab external canal plasty, I'd do that at 12 in case I wanted to do a trap in the future. I'd have the superior nasal conge and the superior temporal conge for a, for a tube shunt if I need. Um, 
but I'm, I'm always looking for the next step. So if, if there's enough room for an, another procedure like a Zen, if there's enough healthy conjunctiva, I, I would do a Zen before I did a tube. Yeah, that's kind of how I've been. In fact, I've been surprised. So, you know, I've done a lot of Zens and, and uh, you know, of course, some of them fibros, it does happen. <laughs> but, um, uh, but no, look, you know, the thing that I've found is that, you know, the ones that have scarred where you have that T-nons that becomes like a thick plate, um, then you, when you open it up and you kind of clean it up, there's no soft T-nons left to scar again. They tend to do great. So my, my Zen revisions tend to do really, really well because I open that scar tissue up and then close it back up again. And yet, yes, you want to have some mobile conjunct. If it's completely flat and scarred and just like, you're done. But, you know, if I, get, if I have a decent amount of tissue where I can loosen up and kind of loosen up the scar tissue, and then you really undermine that tenons and there's no soft tenons left, they tend to do really well. So I, I tend to like to revise my Zens if I did it for sure. You're right, though. If you don't know what happened, if there's a trap, you don't know what the flap looked like, how they fibrose, how it was a flow right afterwards, it is hard to, to know if we should revise it. But but I think, yeah, having healthy conch appear temporally or even in just next to the previous failed trap um i i've definitely used that space for for zen so i think it's definitely appropriate and, and you know and tubes are still very good you know the, all the studies we've seen tubes still are very valuable as well but um you know you guys all mentioned that you would go conventional outflow megs and so tell me tell me is just because you didn't want to deal with the trap or all the complications of subconj megs we thought it would fibrose so why did you pick angle-based megs over a subcon surgery of some sort you know it's really safety profile uh, and I, th I think angle-based procedures are a lot easier on the patient um, because they don't have to come back in so frequently. They don't have to worry about 5-FU injections or needling revisions. And I've, I've had nice success with angle-based surgery, and, and I've, I've had a number of patients that I've gotten down to the low teens. And so I, I want to try that approach first because it, it truly is a micro-invasive approach uh, versus a filtering procedure, which we've been trying to get away from for the last 50 years. And so... Yeah, I know ultimately our, our goal is to preserve vision with whatever we need to do, but I want to try to preserve vision while maintaining quality of life at the same time. And we could have a perfect bleb, but any amount of, of conjunctival irregularity can lead to bleb dysesthesia and chronic foreign body sensation. And so I, I want to utilize a natural system first before I start to manipulate, you know, that conjunctiva. Yeah, I agree. Totally. I think you know, I often think if this were me, if this were my eye, what would I want first? And and I would, I think I would want a MIGS first. Um, I would want something that had a, a faster recovery profile. And and I agree. I think I've had great success in patients who've had previous trabs and even tubes approaching the angle um, after a tube or a trab and gotten great pressure reduction. So I think in this patient, it's a nice first step before considering something subconjunctival. And it gives you that next step that you can have in your back pocket, um, you know, if, if it fails. No, oh, I think it's great. And um, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I think that, um, you know, we, we, we always have the next, we can always go back after doing uh, angle-based MIGs, we can always do a subcon surgery. So, you know, you're not like minimizing or you're not kind of limiting yourself from the future of doing something in subcon if you need to. And I think it's about educating the patient. I mean, I think what we have to get used to now more than ever before is really helping educate patients that this is a long journey and that I'm going to use different technologies, different procedures at my disposal to help maintain that high quality life, like you guys mentioned, as well as trying to control your pressures at the same time. And it may work. It may not work. It may work for a few years. We may have to do something different. And just kind of setting that stage from the beginning, whether it's SLT, whether it's drug delivery, whether it's MIGS, you name it. We're going to try different things along the way. And that's this whole world of interventional glaucoma is setting that stage for the patient as well. So I think you're absolutely right, guys. I mean, that's what I would do too as well. And that's what I did, actually. We'll talk about that. So with that said, Monica, you mentioned you would do a kind of a trabeculotomy, GAT, kind of gonio uh, something uh, procedure. So talk about why that over doing, let's say, stenting or canal dilating procedure. What was your thought process on that? Yeah, I just, um, given the the advanced disease for me, I, I really like doing a 360, um, doing a GAT in a patient like this. Um, I've just had good success with getting great pressure reduction. Um, it is a, a little bit sometimes more of a recovery, so important to consider that if you're trying to do something less invasive, doing a more limited um, trabeculotomy or eye stent is a great option. Um, I do tend to have a higher rate of hyphema after 360 GAT, so that can that can limit recovery. And um, this is her better seeing eye, so something to think about. Um, but I, I just tend to, in my hands, I tend to get great pressure reduction with GAT, and I would do that as a first step in her. 
do you do a suture gut or do you one type of the other other technologies? Just curious. Yeah, I do. I do everything. It depends. I, I operated a, a couple of different sites, so it depends on what I have available. Um, and um, I, I like suture guts and I like eye track too. Um, I do. I do both. Mark, what about you? You mentioned, uh, you know, stenting with a viscodilating combo. Why did you pick that over, let's say, like a GAT type of procedure? Curious. It's just preparing for the next step, really. Um, you know, from from the experience that I had with being in the clinical trial for Infinite, you know, we, we had some train wreck eyes and, and we still got, we we're actually quite surprised at, at the results that we got in patients that have had failed filters and their outflow system, their conventional outflow system was still working. And so with the patients that I've seen from the clinical trial, I'm really comfortable using it in patients like this, but at the same time, just, just knowing the pathophysiologic changes in the outflow system that we see in glaucoma patients, I, I don't think stenting alone uh, addresses all of the areas of outflow that are diseased. And so I, I would like to couple, and I, I hope that we're still able to couple some procedures in the future. I, I know there's an issue with, with reimbursement, but... It, it just makes sense to me to go in and and dilate the, the canal 360 and releasing all those herniations that are obstructing the collector channels um, first and foremost, and then stenting so we have this permanent bypass while at the same time maintaining the blood aqueous barrier and the, the aqueous pump. So I, I kind of want to maximize what's already in the eye uh, while maintaining as much of the anatomy as possible. So, but let me ask you this question then. So you said you're always planning for the next step and I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, curious. Would you then, if the stents and the canal dilating didn't do enough or didn't work, would you then go and do a GAT or would you say, eh, I'm just going to go straight for a subconscious? Like, are you planning on doing a GAT potentially after this if you need to? I would think long-term. So, it, you know, if, if this was something that didn't get me pressure reduction within the first few months, I, I wouldn't go back and do another angle-based procedure in them. Now, I would consider doing a suprachoroidal um, type procedure in this patient. We didn't talk about that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That, that, that would be an option. But if, let's say let's say I put in the stents and they work for four or five years and the pressure started to creep back up, then I'd come back, remove the stents and do the gap procedure. This would be a great alt, and I didn't get a chance to put that in because we, we didn't have enough options. But you know, there's companies now like Yontrek that have come out with already approval of a scler scleral reinforcement scaffolding type of procedure to create that supercortical stent uh, or space rather, um, a cleft. Um, and then we have also other you know kind of investigational devices working on. It. So I think the supercortical space is a great opportunity, especially in this kind of patient too as well, uh, which we didn't get into. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll give for the sake of time, guys. Thanks for this. These are great discussion. For the sake of time, I'll let you know what I did. So. Oh, Mark and I think a lot alike. <laughs> so I did do a, a, a canal canal plastic with the eye track and put the ice in infinite. We were both and I, both Mark and I were in the study too for the infinite trial. But um, it, you know, I, I I never would have thought that I would have done that type of procedure five years ago, um, just because I don't think I realized the, that you could open up the canal like like we've seen. I, you know, I think we were taught traditionally, you do a trab, you bypass it. Guess what? You bypass a conventional pathway, fibrosis, scars, it's inoperable, and you can't open it back up again. And I think we've seen with GAT or with canal plasty, with the stenting, we do see that there is a potential to open things back up again. And I, I really did drink the Kool-Aid with viscodilating and really flushing it out with pressurized, you know, visco delivery uh, as well, and then kind of maintaining the, the stents. And then, and this patient actually has been about. I think a few, you know, six months now, I think four, whatever it's been, it's been a while now, I think, and is doing well, is actually off of medications in the middle teens. The reason I asked you about the, the pressure, she's around 15, 16, she's not low teens, but she's off meds and she's happy. And she's been, it's only been six months, so I can't go into like 10 year data. But that's why, you know, for me, it's like, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay keeping her at 15, 16, not low teens. But minimize the fluctuation. Her vision's not fluctuating. She, I did treat her with some, you know, some Demodex treatments. Now we have, you know, XDMB and, uh, you know, Lotal Honor. So we, that worked out to help her surface of the eye as well. So to me, I do think that there's an opportunity to util utilize a conventional pathway. If you, you know, don't give up on it because we can always go back and do a subconscious trab tube revision and even do some ECP and other stuff later on. But I think trail reopening up the, the conventional pathway uh, is an opportunity. And I think we're seeing that now with interventional glaucoma. So um, no, it's really interesting to hear your thoughts and, and, the, and the audience thoughts because there was a lot of subconj. I think we can't you know, avoid subconj. I think it's still great to have all the options we have. And I'm going to ask you guys tube-wise, you, would you do a, uh, a non-valve tube then or would you do a valve tube? In, in I'd your, go non-valve. Me non too. Yeah. yeah, I would also. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. me too. I think that would give us the best long-term potential for success as well. This was awesome. I love hearing your thoughts. Thank you guys for being so cool and sharing your ideas. And um, thank you to the audience for just sharing and, and kind of submitting all your responses. It's it's great to see you know how we can all learn from each other. And, and even this kind of a format, hearing what everyone else is doing around the country, it's awesome as well. Um, I want to leave it you know, with you guys. Any comments you guys had about this case? Anything else you want to help our audience with? Any, any pearls or suggestions? Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, it's just nice knowing that we have so many different options. Uh, you know, when we did our fellowships, this patient would have had the next step would have been a tube and then a diode. But now we have so many different options. There is no one correct answer for this patient because there's so many different things that we can do. And, and it comes down to what works best in your own hands. Absolutely. Monica? Yeah, I would say two things. First of all, I think our discussion about pressure goals is so huge and understanding that there's a huge value to to reducing fluctuations in addition to lowering pressure and keeping that in mind when you're thinking about next steps. And then secondly, I, I agree. I think it's an exciting time to be a glaucoma specialist and, and thinking about long-term for our patients. And the step after the next step is really important. And this is a great case to demonstrate that. So thanks for the case and thanks for including me. No, it's awesome. And uh, look forward to having more discussions as well. I was thinking just now as we we're talking, like, you know, if the patient does need lower pressure, I might just add a little, little drug delivery. Why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why not? I can't get hurt. Right. Um, so, no, and even, even now adding, like, let's say an IDOS at the time of these, uh, you know, these mixed procedures too. And now, uh, now it has a permanent J code might be an opportunity too, as well. So a lot of cool options, but again, thank you both for joining. And thank you to everybody out there for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into this episode of GT the Podcast. If you have any feedback or topic suggestions, find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. And stay tuned for more hot topics in glaucoma care on GT the Podcast.